Good idea. <coughs> uh, my three words of Italian, grazia, and uh, I've already forgotten the other two. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Giovanni. Uh, it has been my distinct pleasure to work with this group over the last four years and uh, work on and in the city of Florence. It is uh, always a pleasure. It is always beautiful to come to any building uh, to meet people who care about their city, who care about the history, to care about the culture of Florence and Italy. And so any American is very privileged to come here and be with you. I see the picture that you see here uh, and you recognize what a terrible thing a major flood is. We have just experienced in the United States very large floods. Houston, the fourth largest city in the United States. Millions of people and a good part of that city underwater. Uh, the, the, the territory of Puerto Rico, the state of Florida. And then of course at the same time we have the terrible wildfires in California. All of this is to say that disasters like this, natural disasters, are not something that uh, we can blame on nature. They are, we intersect with the land where nature is and we have not reached an accommodation. You face that, it is a challenge we all face and how do we, in a world that's so different now than it was 100 years ago, how are we moving ahead? Uh, what I would like to talk to you today is the story of the report of the International Technical and Scientific Committee uh, this is the report that was published today uh, by the University of Florence. I am very proud of the work that went into this by so many different people to put this report forward and to share it with you. The uh, committee was formed, as you've heard earlier, in uh, 2014 with the individuals you see there, an international group. Although Professor Garcia is at the University of Illinois, his background is in Argentina. And so we have a very disparate group of people who are working on this and have been working on this. There's a little red star against uh, Professor Seminara because he is the person that was behind thinking this thing through and uh, it has made the very big difference. I owe and the committee owes so very much to uh, Giovanni and we also owe a lot to, you've already seen here today, uh, that Giorgio Federici has been a very strong voice in our ears as to what to do and where to do it and making sure it uh, takes place. And uh, of course, Gabriella Montagnagni, who has uh, been really the spirit behind what we've done, and Luca Solari of the university, who has been uh, responsible for the report itself and many other very interesting parts of what we've done. We started in July of 2014, and we are uh, expected to finish today when we have this report released. So we are very comfortable uh, that we have had and been given the time to look at this, to give you, the people of Florence and the governments, an idea of what we saw the challenges to be. Uh, we made a final report actually in Rome and in Florence last year, and we have spent this year uh, getting through all of the reviews we thought were important and publishing the actual report. What were we asked to do? Uh, these are the, the two major issues we were asked to address in 2014. One is to look at what is the state of the works that were proposed and underway planned after the flood of 1966. Are we on the right track? The second is what's going to take place? What should we be thinking about for the future, especially given the fact that we are in a world in which climate change is appearing every day to be even stronger than we had thought before, and our a world of uncertainty grows every day. So we started off to see where we've been and where we're going to go, and I'd like to start by saying that we were impressed from the very beginning with the very hard work that was done by the authorities that had been done over the years, what they had tried to do, given the resources that were available to them and given the challenges they faced, uh, they've been facing these difficult problems. We have seen since 2014 when, when the 
we began to talk about uh, this, the commemoration of the 50th anniversary, people began to move ahead. And we have seen many things uh, move ahead here in Florence, uh, here in Tuscany, and, uh, and certainly in Rome. And we're impressed by that. Uh, whatever we say in the report is meant to be helpful. It is not to be, meant to be critical of any one individual or group. It is our expression of the things we saw that we thought were important as you all move forward, the people of this region, the people of this country, and as we recognize how important uh, the culture preservation is, that we take steps now in Florence, but around the world to deal with this issue. And we'll hear more about that later on this morning. So today, I would like to tell you what the ITSC said, uh, where we are today, and then where are we going in the future. Uh, some background. You all know better than I do what Tuscany is in the Arno River and how important that has been in history. It is amazing to me to see the engineers and, and scientists that are here today that are dealing with the same sorts of issues that Leonardo faced uh, 500 years ago. We have people have been struggling with these things around the world, but especially here at a center of knowledge. Uh, we, we see here the, uh, the allegorical Arno River pouring out of the vase, pouring that water into the, the land, and it creates the, the waters, good and bad, that have appeared. Uh, the floods that have occurred as far back as 1333, uh, where we have a mark of what the flood is, and we've seen this over time. So the Arno has been part of the life of the community. It has been part of the sorrow of the community, and especially uh, when you're looking at the city of Florence itself. Uh, Florence grew up having mills and weirs, Pescale, the gravel mining, the ports. All of these things have to go on and make a, a real uh, change in the way the river operates. We see this around the world, that uh, having a river, especially a river that goes through the middle of a major city, it is very difficult. And every little change you make uh, makes problems for the people that are there, makes it more difficult to do the work. Certainly, one of the great beauties of Florence are the bridges and yet those bridges offer interesting challenges to engineers, not only yesterday, but the days before and in the future. What's going to happen? Uh, from the very simplest part of bridges being an obstacle for flows with all sorts of material floating in them, very unusual things. We've seen in the United States uh, houses floating down the river and blocking the movement of water through there. Uh, so it is something that everyone is accustomed to but has to recognize that it is always something to worry about. Um, Leonardo came up with the idea of diverting water around Florence. When the floodwaters come, uh, go around the city of Florence. We have done that in major cities in the United States, and it has worked very effectively. Uh, the problem is you take up a great deal of real estate, and when you plan for diversions and other activities, and the land is used for something else, it's very difficult to go back and ask people to move where they've been in the past. So that's been a struggle. That goes back that far, the land that is required for diversions. Uh, we've seen dams be put into place uh, in large scale and smaller scale uh, for water supply and for flood control that are very useful and are part of the system. But again, each one of those was built with a design uh, at a certain period of time and that needs to be constantly looked at. We just experienced this major flood in Houston, and you can see on the front pages of every newspaper the two major reservoirs or dams near the city of Houston, and everyone complaining that the reservoirs were not big enough. They did not hold enough money, uh, water. Uh, they didn't have enough money to make them bigger. But now, after the flood, people are beginning to say, yes, let's enlarge them, let's in, in take up more land to store the water, and that's what will happen. It is too bad with any dam that you don't progress as time moves along with expanding the capability when that capability is necessary. So that's been part uh, of this, as well as storing water off on the sides of the rivers. Uh, the retention areas have been extremely important uh, in this area. They will be extremely important. Many places have been suggested. Many are already planned. It is interesting, again, that uh, it, they go back a long way. I will say that uh, when I worked in China, I've discovered that the Emperor Yu uh, was the emperor in 2000 years BC. He became the Emperor Great. The Emperor Great Yu 
when he came up with the idea and the Yangtze River was flooding all the time, that at certain points in time he had to have places where he could store the water so it would not flood out the city. And that enhanced his reputation. And today in China, there are 93 areas within the country that are set aside as detention areas for floods, 23 of which are used on a very frequent basis and are occupied by people who have to move out of the way. So we are struggling with issues that are not anything new, but they are tied up in the funds and the social life, the politics of doing all of these sorts of things. And then, of course, war played a role here in Florence and in the uh, uh, Ponta Santa Trinita had some very interesting challenges. And when you rebuild bridges after a war or, or you rebuild bridges uh, frequently, the structure is the most beautiful and most important thing, and people forget about the hydraulics of passing the water through. In each case, we say it is important uh, that the history take into account what's happened and what might happen in the future. Well, let's go to 1966. What were our reactions to 1966? After that, you had the plans that are shown on here, the DeMarchi Commission uh, and its ideas. It sparked a, a move around the country. It was important to uh, Italy that we think in terms of natural disasters. And so it started uh, you and the, the country off on dealing with this. And we've had a series of plans more recently than DeMarchi, obviously, to look at this uh, that became more specific about what needed to be done. Each of these have been reviewed. There's different viewpoints. But each of them has produced good plans, but not as much action as you'd expect or hope. So we knew in 1967 much of what needed to be done, but not very much actually progressed between 1966 and 1996. And then the increased action began to move towards more activity to be planned, but not necessarily funded. What did the ITSC come up with in terms of its recommendations? This is the, the fundamental statement, that there have been these plans. There have been plans that are around for the last 20 years, but we've fallen behind in implementing the plans. The second part, given that, Florence remains at risk of flooding. If we had a 1966 flood uh, tomorrow, we would not be in good shape. And it is not a question of whether that kind of a flood is going to occur again. It's a question of when. Uh, there is little doubt among hydrologists around the world, meteorologists, that the, the number of major events are occurring, are increasing, and that certainly the challenge in the Arno will be the same as it is in many other areas. The risk today, it does not provide the protection, the risk reduction needed for the city and is not at the level appropriate for a city with the treasures here that belong to you who live in this region, but belong to the world. The price, they are so valuable in our heritage, they are so valuable in our culture, that it is important to recognize that they must be protected. So the risk exists to those today. What are the goals? Well, we say there is no clear agreement yet as to what the goals are. And, and I will uh, note that in the United States we face uh, many of the same problems. Uh, we have ideas as to what we want to do, and in this particular case, how much water you want to pass down the Arno River through the middle of Florence. Uh, what is the, the flow? What is the volume of that flow? Uh, we know that you'd like to have these at certain levels, but what will that do? What level of protection will that give you? Uh, how do you decide that? Uh, do you balance off the economics and say economics are very important, and we'll talk about this in a second, or do you uh, take into account the social, cultural aspects of that and balance those two and put them together? Uh, so there is not a clear agreement that we have found among everyone. That we, we have discovered that the government is moving that direction at all levels to determine what is the agreed upon approach to take, but we have not seen that fully satisfied. And we note that a normal safety standard for Safety of people, a normal safety standard for economics, the funding, does not equal the level of protection necessary for something that has this area of culture and heritage. How are we valuing these? Uh, that's an interesting challenge. Uh, in establishing priorities in, in the reports that have been written, and it's not only in the Florence area, it is not only in Tuscany, it is not only in Italy, is we're establishing priorities and defining risk, what that means. It's easy to say 
that the failure to do this, to have a flood, will cause economic damages because we can count up how many buildings will be flooded, how many people will have to be moved, and come up with an economic risk. But how do you deal with all of the other challenges, the risks that exist? Uh, we don't think that the understanding of the social and cultural damages, what they mean, are well understood and properly valued. How do you measure this term priceless? How do you, how do you put aside some of the works of art that you have in this city and, and look at them? When you look at this map, which uh, tells you something about uh, uh, the, the risk zones, the darker the purple tends to be uh, that at highest risk, uh, by definition of risk, which is the, the consequences and the probability there's something wrong there, that the worst consequences are not in the city centers of, of Florence. That is very strange to us and would indicate that we need to have increased emphasis on protecting not only the economic well-being of the region, but there has to be greater emphasis on protecting the cultural heritage of this region and, and the uh, well-being, the social structure of the people that live in this particular area. We also believe that uh, there is no such thing as a silver bullet or a single answer to protecting uh, this particular area. Uh, we cannot address all of Florence's flood problems with one structure. It would be very nice. When I began working in engineering 60 years ago, it, that tended to be the answer. Let's build a dam, let's build a wall, and that'll solve the problems. But it doesn't work anymore. We've seen that, and so success is gonna require having a portfolio. Many items in our activities, many island, items in terms of what we are going to build, and many items we're gonna do outside of that, the non-structural measures. We'll talk about that in a second. It requires, though, when you have all of these, it was very easy. I, I, as I heard uh, Giovanni mention, uh, we, uh, I work for the Army Corps of Engineers. We run the Mississippi Valley. When the Mississippi River, which drains 41 of our uh, states, it is, uh, when it comes, there's a lot of water there. And we are able to run that river as a system as it goes down the middle of the United States. Uh, but no longer is it just the system of getting the water out, it's what do you do with the environment, what do you do with the people, what do you do with the other factors that have to be considered, and we have to take all of those into account. If we are going to use diversions, if we are going to have off-river storage, if we are going to have zoning, we're gonna refuse to let people develop in many areas, which is very sensitive politically, uh, all of these things mean we have to be working together, and we believe that in dealing with the Arno, there has to be a great deal of integration among people who are responsible for the many aspects of that. The non-structural measures we talk about are all of these things like land use planning, how important that is, and, and where we have to go with that. Uh, what can you do? Can you relocate? We are in the process, and again, I'm sorry to relate back to uh, what is very close to me now because I've spent the last few weeks in Texas trying to figure out how you take 30,000 homes and uh, figure out what to do with the people who are very badly flooded. We are beginning to relocate many of those, non-essential. We don't relocate the, the most critical facilities, but we do relocate homes. And how do you put them somewhere else? How do you do that? But that's a very useful tool now because once you move somebody, they're not gonna flood again unless you allow somebody to move back in. But uh, you want to reduce the occupancy in the flood zones. You wanna relocate the, the non-historical structures. Early warning is a terribly important thing. And in your case, uh, we report that uh, that is extremely important because of the fact that it can occur so quickly. In the major floods we had in Houston, and major floods we've seen around the world while we were doing this study, we found that the time to uh, the accumulation of massive amounts of floodwaters is reducing. And so we have interesting challenges if you don't have an up-to-date warning system that lets people evacuate and they believe in the system. Too many people do not believe in the system. So you need in your non-structural, the early warning systems. Flood insurance is something that is being adapted worldwide. We have a national flood insurance in the United States. Uh, there are, uh, France has very good programs. Uh, there are commercial programs, but it is very difficult to enact. It's just another thing that needs to be done. And lastly, you can, in fact, flood proof 
buildings, and we believe that that's an important part of your arsenal. Flood storage management. Uh, we've mentioned before that you, when you have upstream storage, and it's planned in the, the work on the Arno, and you need that upstream storage, and you need it in reservoirs, or you need it in the off-stream uh, side, uh, as is being developed upstream right now, uh, you need to have that coordinated so you know what the level of storage you have, how much can be used, and you understand what happens when that fills up. Uh, all the store river storage is very good. Uh, dam storage is very good. But if the dam becomes full and the off-river storage becomes full, have you thought through what is happening, how much you really have, and are you managing that? And so such a management program is going to be critical and we did not find it, uh, that that was present. Uh, so we're, we're sort of asking that today perhaps we can discuss with the very uh, great people that are here today what is actually being done. The other thing is engineering is changing. Uh, the things that I learned in, as an undergraduate at Princeton University uh, in engineering, if I did it that way today, I would go to jail because engineering standards have changed, our environmental rules have changed, our safety rules have changed. So we think that uh, between 1966 and today, there are many changes. And we know after talking to the engineers uh, in the region that they are considering new ways to do things and new engineering codes of standards, new approaches, and we think that that's terribly important. And we suggest that you might even want to put out a call to the world just to incentivize the world to say, let us help uh, dealing with the flood problem in Florence, ask uh, what we can give you as ideas, and then Florence absorb those and pick the ones that may be of help to you. And again, we, we would very much like to discuss today where we are. Now, the hydraulics of the Arno through Florence, uh, I was out yesterday, I saw the, uh, the beach is still there. There are many things that are in the river. We've done the modeling at the university here. Uh, how much of that can you have? How much of that becomes a problem? What modeling exists to deal with that? Uh, the numerical models and the physical models are important, but they have to keep be kept up to date. We have to look at the, the what ifs. Uh, what if something happens and, and there is some sort of change? We've had major, we've seen around the world, major disasters occur because uh, people didn't understand that the hydraulic situation when there is a flood and there are deviations caused by uh, material in the, in the particular stream, a wall collapses, creates some sort of a disturbance, and you have a problem that is very difficult to deal with. And again, we think it's important uh, that we look at these and we again ask that that be discussed further. We think uh, we haven't thought enough about the Arno River ecosystem. Uh, again, it is not jumped to the top of the list on anybody's uh, list. But it is there, and it is a reality that you want to preserve the river ecosystem. And we were unable to find out uh, where it fit overall. And again, we'd hope today that we might have the opportunity to discuss that further with you. Risk communication. The biggest challenge that we see is that most people don't understand that a flood can happen. I asked cab drivers here in town, I asked people I saw on the street, our committee talked to many, many people, and they all sort of feel that it's been solved. Uh, there, there is no risk. Uh, the people that are more in tune uh, and who live around here and deal with these particular issues certainly know the risk, but to the average uh, citizen, they recognize there has been a flood, there could be another, but as we find worldwide that People just assume that if the government thought there was a problem, they'd tell us, and therefore we don't have to do anything. Uh, we think it's important, not only for this, from the standpoint of the people that live here, but the people that support you in Rome and other places around the world in terms of the, the natural heritage, is that everybody understand what the possibilities are and look at that realistically. Now, uh, we, in our first report, commented that there were not enough things being done. And we were reminded by the mayor that uh, there were actually things being done. We've suggested things like a museum of the Arno, publications. Uh, Dr. Federici uh, spoke about several of those. Those are all good. So we put up a line like this that says, it's not as 
bad as we thought it was when we started this because over time, you all, with the, the approach of the 50th anniversary in the, this particular region, spent a lot of time dealing with risk communication and are trying to improve that risk communication. But we all, human beings, have this natural ability to resist the fact that it will happen to me. It will always be somebody else, and I'm not worried about it. Uh, until somebody says, do you realize that tonight it could start to rain and we could have a real problem? And they all recognize then, I'd better have something in my mind. Uh, we're, we're not going to solve the problem completely. So we have a broken line on saying that there's more to be done. Uh, what we've talked about several times, you've heard it in the, in the uh, discussions earlier, we'll talk about it for the rest of the day, is that we've come up with plans. And the problem is getting the money started uh, up until 2014, really getting moving on some of the projects was lagging behind. And the promise of future flooding uh, was not uh, there. Uh, future flood protection was not there. And so we believe, and we have reported, that it is important that acceleration of this work be done and that we get people moving on solving these particular issues, identifying what in the plans are still relevant, moving ahead with those, and funding the projects to be done uh, not later but now. We were absolutely d delighted to find that uh, funds have been available in several areas, but we are raising the question of where are they in the program over time? Someone that tells me, yes, they're in a program, and the program is 20 or 30 years out, that's a long time to wait with the potential of flooding. And so we are <coughs> very interested in having that discussion take place today. And one of my jobs is to, to try and ask you, the participants here today, to ask the tough questions on where do we stand. National support is critical. Obviously, this is bigger than what can be done at the regional or in the local level. And we are very uh, pleased with the positive change seen in Rome with uh, dealing with this long-standing problems with hazards. And uh, we are impressed by their determination to help you out. Because without this national support, it's going to be very difficult to move ahead. We were absolutely delighted when we met in Rome when uh, uh, Professor Grassi here, uh, who happens to, I understand now, live in Florence but uh, commutes to Rome, uh, in works in the Prime Minister's office, uh, it is extremely important that he stated before the group we had in Rome that whatever it takes, the federal government will provide. The only question we would ask uh, him to address today is whatever it takes is how soon that money is coming and how fast it can be here to do some of the projects. And I'm sure that will be part of the discussion. But what a significant change over these last four years in the determination of the people in Rome to assist in dealing with these projects. We think it's also important that uh, in Rome, the, the Italian government uh, push for comprehensive planning. We know that things are taking place organizationally in the basin structure, so that there is more of an opportunity to develop comprehensive plans. But again, without a comprehensive plan, recognizing what each basin and each sub-basin does to the others, what these connections are, we're going to have a, a, a long way to go. And we recommend that the Italian government uh, appoint some sort of an independent commission to keep, uh, as, to provide advisory information to the public, to provide advice to the people that are working in this area, and that they be independent and they not include anybody that's been on the previous uh, commission, simply because we want this to be totally independent with lots of new ideas. Uh, and again, where do we stand on those in the long run? Uh, the last thing I really would like to talk about <coughs> excuse me, uh, is climate change impacts. As you know, in the United States, we've uh, been accused of not believing in climate change. Uh, I will tell you there's very few people in the United States today that uh, don't believe in climate change. We've had it affect every part of our country. Uh, it, I think the battle now is how do you best reduce the impact of climate change? How do you best reduce greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, and how long it will be before we reach too, too much. Well, uh, we could argue that all day, and I don't think our committee did that, but we did look at what were the records that might affect the people in this region. And, and at the time when we started this, the, the IPCC and the other climate predictors said, well, there are going to be cha challenges, but uh, they will be somewhat like they have been in the past. 
In the last two years, worldwide, we've seen a, a substantial increase in the number of, of heavy storm events. Uh, the very fact that we had 51 inches of rainfall in Houston, Texas, something that had never been seen before, that we had the kinds of hurricanes we had in Puerto Rico that we'd never seen before, tell us, along with many other places around the world, that there are changes and the scientists are agreeing that we are liable to have climate events that are going to be significantly more impactful, cause much more damage than have happened before. And so we need to look at what are you going to do. Uh, for the non-scientists in the, the world, in, in 2009, the meteorologists and hydrologists in the United States wrote an article called uh, Stationarity is Dead. And stationarity is the concept by which what happens is you all my lifetime, I measured what it was going to be in the future by looking to the rear and seeing what the hydraulic record, hydrologic record showed. I might have 5,000 years of record on the Nile. Uh, but in some of the newer rivers, we didn't see that, or rivers that we began to gauge. But we've learned recently that that's not the case. Even with good records, there's some sort of a break taking place now because of the changes and shifts in climate. And most scientists believe that stationarity is dead. We cannot have good predictions. When somebody tells you it is a 100-year or a 200-year event and is a standard, uh, that is a statistical concept. It is not, there is nothing written, nothing on the wall that tells you today it's a 200-year level here because a big flood, a big rainfall event can change that entirely tomorrow and it's two feet or one foot uh, higher or lower depending on what your records turn out to be. And so we are dealing with a great deal of uncertainty and they say we must Im look at the impacts of larger events. What if you had something that was significantly higher coming than the 66 flood? What would you do? And what we have learned, and we are recommending that we discuss today, is the idea that if you know that there could be something in excess of the 66 flood, which seems to be uh, a relative target now for the future, what would you do if it was knowingly going to be bigger than that? What steps could you take in the very short term? Or what if tonight we could predict that uh, this week we are going to have another flood? What would you do in the interim to pass that flood through? What steps could you take upstream to store water offline? Uh, where would you put that water? And think these things through. Uh, we have labeled that the, the whole world of resilience, being able to look ahead and plan for the unthinkable. And we call those <coughs> black swan events the things that you never think about. But doesn't mean you have to buy the land, that you have to buy the structures, you have to, when you're planning for the future and thinking about this, that you have to go out and fund such a thing until you know considerably more. But it says that the first part of resilience is understanding what could happen. And we urge that uh, developing emergency plans should be a key part of resilience for the Florence area for the future. <coughs> Uh, the bottom line is what I started with. Florence remains at risk uh, to significant flooding, and uh, it grows every day. We, we know there are changes taking place, and we've got to be ready for them. We don't think you have the protection you need today. We think you're on the way to getting it, and uh, we'd like to see that happen. And our bottom line is it's time for action now, and we hope what's going on is a, a sign for the future. Uh, thank you very much.